Hello, everyone. Welcome to APH Access Academy. Today is Code Jumper 101B. We are so happy to have you join us today. Feel free to drop who you are and where you're from into the chat. I have also launched the poll asking what your job title is, quadrant of the US where you're from, and how you heard about the webinar. If you are also here for ACV REP credit, your opening code word is counters, C-O-U-N-T-E-R-S. Your opening code word is counters. If you are also joining us and need captions, those are provided with a link to stream text. You'll need to click on that to get it. Good afternoon, wherever you are. We are so happy to have you join us today. There is a poll available to let us know what is your job title, where you are from, and how you heard about the webinar. If you can't access it, feel free to drop information in the chat. Welcome, Alabama. Glad to have you with us. Again, you are at the APH Access Academy. This is Code Jumper 101B. We did have A earlier this um, last month. You are welcome to watch that again, but we are going into B. The code word case is not sensitive. Uh, you should be able to do it with capitals or lowercase, should be just fine. The opening code word is counters, C O U N T E R S. Again, Paul, I need you to go on mute for a minute. <laughs> okay, there you go. This is the Access Academy from APH. I'm gonna end the poll and share those results. We have a majority of teachers with students with visual impairments, but we have a good 50% of orientation mobility instructors, some students in a college program and an assistive technology specialist, welcome. And where you are from, we're kind of tied, Northeast, Southeast, and Northwest. And how you heard about the webinar email from APH, which seems to be the one that works for most. Last time verbally, your opening code word is counters, C-O-U-N-T-E-R-S. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Paul. All right, thank you. So uh, welcome in everybody for uh, Code Jumper 101B. And as we get started, let's talk about what we're going to be doing for the next little bit. So our introductions and our objectives, we'll go through an overview of 10 advanced lessons in Code Jumper. We'll talk about adding custom sounds, which to me is definitely the most fun. And then next steps in computer science. Uh, questions uh, in, the, in the chat. Uh, you may be able to raise your hand as well. To ask a question, we have ACVREP credit, as you know, closed captioning is provided and it's going to be in the link that Leanne just put in there through stream text, not in the Zoom. So use that link, please, if you want to view the captions. Okay, Code Jumper, just a review in case you need it. For non-quota purchases, the price is $999. For quota purchases, it is $769. You have the APH catalog number there if you need it to search for it. Uh, otherwise, you should be able to just go and find it easily enough on the APH website. Our presenters, familiar to you if you were in session A, Beth Dudica. Senior Manager Content Development from I2E, and Robin Lowell, Senior Manager Accessibility for I2E. We have three learning objectives we'll go through today. We're going to engage in 10 advanced lessons for Code Jumper, go through some important things in those lessons, what they cover, and how you can best use them. We'll learn how to add custom sounds to the Code Jumper app. Uh, I would request sport sounds. And we'll discuss how Code Jumper prepares all students for the next steps in computer science. So we have a lot to go through. So let's turn it over to our presenters. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Robin Lowell, and um, I'm sure many of you are in the uh, 
101A session and just to kind of recap, I am the Senior Manager for Accessibility for I2E. I am also a teacher of students with visual impairments, have been for 15 years and I've worked in many different settings. I was itinerant, um, classroom, um, also distance education and residential. So I've seen it all, done it all and um, uh, I have been working on the CoJumper uh, curriculum and product for a little over a year now. And that has been such an exciting um, project that uh, Beth and I have gotten to work on, getting the curriculum all designed and put together and out there. Um, so I'm really excited today to take you more in depth into CoJumper and what the more advanced lessons and possibilities are. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Beth. Thanks, Robin. I am an elementary aged uh, educator at heart, but I then uh, transitioned in my career to become a computer programmer, curriculum developer. I helped with Robin building the Code Jumper curriculum. I just love computer science, so I'm super excited to be here. Um, uh, one of the things that is so great, if you have, if you know nothing about computer science, it's okay. If you did not take session A, it's okay. You're going to be just fine. We are here to walk you through some of those things um, and help make you feel a little bit more comfortable about helping all kids learn about this. So thanks. Thanks all for right. having me. So we talked about this in 101A and I think it's something that we need to revisit again because I think it's something we need to always think about is why is CoJumper so important? Um, and CoJumper is so important because it's really that springboard. It's an opportunity for students to learn from that early age that, um, yes, I can code. I can be a computer scientist and I can think like a computer scientist. Um, currently, um, outside of CoJumper, there's, there's not much that our students with visual impairments can use when they are learning beginning coding skills. We have pro products like Microbit and we have Scratch for our fantastic programs, but they are all visual. And so you have to use your mouse and drag and drop in um, block coding, which can be um, useful, but if you're not using a mouse or if you're not able to see what's happening on the screen, you may be able to be part of that um, design process, but not being able to access that outcome is um, a hindrance for, again, keeping that idea that yes, I can code and yes, I can be a computer scientist. So there really needs to be this, this idea that um, the younger we're teaching our kids that I can code and giving them full access to um, coding curriculum and coding skills, um, the easier it is going to be as they get older to continue and build on that knowledge when we um, we transition to from block based coding to text based coding, which we'll talk about those, uh, you know, towards the end more a little bit about more of that transition and what comes next um, in computer science. So that's really the why. And I think the biggest part is yes, I can in my little soapbox of code jumper. All right. So Let's think about, we talked about this before, the curriculum layout. We have the two different um, areas. Can you share your screen? Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for stopping me because- That might be helpful. Uh, that would be extremely <laughs> helpful. Well, Robin is pulling that up. I'll go through the um, opening of the curriculum. In the last sessions, we covered more of the primary lessons. And in this session, we're gonna be covering a, a few more of the advanced lessons. And we're gonna go into much more detail about a few concepts that um, are repeated a lot in, in computer science and in programming that we think students really need to know. Um, so the layout, the, the lessons we're gonna cover, some of them today, um, we're not gonna go into great depth in all of them. We won't cover all of them, but uh, constants, selection and conditionals, uh, random variables, counters, nested loops, networks, topologies, protocols, binary numbers, and Boolean logic. Um, in the last session, if you missed it, we covered uh, computer systems, sequence and algorithms, parameters, threads, debugging, loops, sequences, and decomposition. And the, the lessons themselves are all on the CoJumper website. So if you haven't yet, and you want to follow along with some of our lessons, 
you can go to codejumper.com and at the top bar menu of re tab for resources is an option um, to see each of the lessons. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there too. There's a, there's a course in the Microsoft Educator community that will walk you through step by step by step how to use all the pieces of CodeJumper. So if you get finished here and you can't remember how something works or why, you could go back there and look at it. There's a user guide, um, all the lessons, um, the assessments and all the tutorial videos are all under this resources page. So Robin's going to go and click on the lessons under Code Jumper lessons. Did it? Stalling out. That's okay. Oh. Um, okay. Hmm. It's. And do you want to? No. It's showing now. I see lessons. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. I'm having a little bit of a delay, I think, between your speaking and so it might just be me. Um, so, Robin, do you want to talk through the first part of one of your lessons that oh, yeah. we're going to go through? Sure. OK, so we have um, uh, we have again the two different sections um, on the website. It's nice because you can get the um, the lessons in the PDF version or an HTML version, whatever you prefer. You can have those for both. And so for advanced lessons, we have nine through 19. So we have quite a few of more advanced lessons. We do the primary. So there's a lot of really great concepts in here. So nine as you know, nine through um, 14 are all really heavily um, code jumper kit based. Everything is based off of code jumper kit. But then when we get to 15, we have networks, topologies, protocols, binary numbers, and Boolean logic. And these are, um, some of them use the code jumper kit, but these concepts, these uh, 15 through 19 are, there's more advanced computer science concepts that may not lend themselves very well to using it on the kit, but this is what makes this curriculum a very well-rounded and full um, experience for, for beginning coding that all students need to um, experience. So I'm going to click on lesson number 15, which is networks. And this is something that, you know, whether we realize it or not, we all deal with networks all day long. If you're in a school system, you have your school network and all the computers are connected and they're talking to each other. Um, and so how do we easily you know, teach this concept to our students of networks with computers giving each other information. So the the um, the format is a little bit different. So in in our lessons that we've um, previously had, we had a um, unguided, I mean, sorry, unplugged, not unguided, um, unplugged lesson that was not using the kit that was all really hands on and um, non not necessarily super high tech. And then we had a guided lesson where the teacher really guides the students using the code jumper kit and then the opportunity for um, more in depth exploration where the students are really working on their own and, and problem solving. So in a lot of these other lessons at the end, um, we have an introductory lesson activity, which in this case for um, networks is a is an unplugged lesson. And then we have a lesson extension activity, which can be a second more in depth. Um, and in depth lesson. So let me kind of walk you through what it would look like for the introductory lesson activity. So networks, we have we have our vocabulary, we have a network and we have a packet. So a network is a group of computers or electronic devices connected together by cables or Wi-Fi to share data and sources. So just like we're doing now, code jumpers connected, you know, sharing information to the hub to the computer. So that's a that's a connection. And um, then a packet is a unit of data sent from one computer to another um, or device over the network. And so that's really that information of sending it over the network. So in this activity, it's really fun. It's, it's hands-on and um, you basically create your network with strings. So you have one student either holding the string or is taped to the desk, desk near them. And then it runs to another student in a different part of the classroom. And then from there it goes to, so you get this basically a web, worldwide web, you get this web, a spider web of string around your room. And um, then you, you basically send your data over, you send a message over. So you have a network card, which can be like a three and a half by five card and you can braille on it, or, you know, print, whatever, send over a picture, whatever you want to, whatever information, how it best is sent. 
you put it into an envelope and using a paper clip, you literally physically slide it down that string. And because that string, the student can even just, you know, trail and, and, and be able to um, move that packet all the way down to the other, the other student and, and then trail their way back. Um, and so they sent that piece of information over and then they can send that piece of information on. So being able to physically learn um, how a network works. And um, so it's a great activity um, that can be done without a computer. And so in the last session, and we were talking about, well, in this remote setting, how do we still apply that? And, and our, one of the ideas that came up with was um, the mail, the mail system. So you can have a student write a letter, write an instruction, not a letter, write an instruction to another um, a peer or to the teacher, write the address on there, put it in the mailbox, in the actual mailbox, and then it gets sent to that next person. And then that person then has their information or their instructions of what to do next. You can say something like, once you've received this card, send it to another peer or send it to, to somebody else. Um, so they're seeing how that information moves along the chain in a network. Um, and it's a great way to keep kids connected um, as well in that, that kind of chain from one person to the next. Think about it as like the um, uh, chain mail that we used to do when we were kids a long time ago and sending the dollar and see how many dollars you can get or sending the dollar on. So kind of fun. But this is one example of a, of a lesson <clears throat> that kind of goes beyond the scope of CodeJumper. But again, this is really important, thinking about um, what um, CodeJumper, what comes next after it. And these are really critical skills that our students need to be able to move on to that next step in coding. Um, Beth, is there anything you'd like to add about, um, about these no. lessons? No, some of these more abstract concepts, um, you'd be surprised even older kids have misconceptions about how data is sent and how we communicate with computers, how computers communicate with each other. Um, and programming is all about what you communicate. And so most of what kids figure out when they are debugging or when they have an error is because of their, uh, they missed something or they assumed something. Um, so it's really good practice to understand something like the networks or um, string example that Robin gave in that lesson makes it more tangible. And it's, it's surprising how frequent kids come back to that. Um, I would say that those lessons at the end don't have to go completely at the end. Um, a lot of the code jumper stuff is fairly, you know, um, nice to go in sequence only because they build upon each other. But the last few lessons that Robin was pointing out that are mostly unplugged uh, could be infiltrated a little bit earlier. Some of them are a little harder to grasp. The, you know, the real primary students probably may not ever fully develop that understanding that you would want to in a in the networks lesson, but um, they might start to. You could probably adapt pieces of it. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, we, we should probably cover the rubric um, yes. for the assessments as well, since you're on the web page. Do you want to scroll yeah. back to the rubric? Yes. Here we go. So I went back to the resources page and down um, on one of the options is the code jumper assessments. So we've talked about this a little bit more, but let's dump, let's jump into what these look like for the advanced lesson. Mm -hmm. I like this advanced um, <clears throat> project because at the end, uh, you really get a feel for what your students actually took away and are able to implement on their own. And one of these is a great temp. Is it the template? I can't quite read it. Uh, uh, yeah, the template. I haven't gone to the template yet. So. Oh yeah. So I'm, um, on the, um, I'm on the just the project is what the assessment is page. Sure. <clears throat> do you want to read? Do you want to read it? <laughs> the, um, so really, what we're looking at for the assessment is. Um, the, the students are going to be creating a programming, a game, a story, or a song. So there's, there's the different aspects of this assessment. So we're looking at project planning, brainstorming, and using their computer science journal and getting those ideas down, program creation. So um, that going through and being able to actually create their program, 
um, you know, using each component that they have in the rubric and has says what all exactly you need to be using, you know, for the advanced, of course, we're using selection pod, which we'll learn about very shortly, and all the different aspects of the um, advanced lessons in CoJumper. Um, what is in the advanced assessment that's not in the um, earlier one for the primary is there's a peer review. It's an opportunity for students to um, really engage in the, each other's work and learn about, you know, how to critique and, and how to help other their peers debug and figure out what's working and what's not in their um, in their assessment before it um, goes to teacher review. And then there's the opportunity to have a project presentation where there's that demonstration of learning where the, um, the student can either present their, pro their project to the teacher or present it to the class. So there's all these four different areas. And then we can go into the um, assessment rubric and, um, but let, we're gonna look at the uh, computer science journal and um, so, you know, throughout the, the curriculum, using this computer science journal is, is really great. Um, normally, there is not a template for the, for the uh, journal, but for this assessment that we've uh, created a, a journal um, template with the, um, the game, the story or song, opportunities to put their ideas down for that just brainstorming and idea gathering, creating a project title, and then there's a checklist of making sure that you, you have everything included in your project, like using the hub and the loop, the merge pod, all these different plugs that we have and variables and sound sets and whatnot. So making sure you, you are able to demonstrate your knowledge of all the different areas in CodeJumper. And then you have a title and then just different information you can put down about your project and create it. Um, and then have that nice um, framework and structure that you can use. So that's really the areas of the, uh, the advanced assessment. So it's a little more in depth than the um, than what we see um, in the primary one. And it's I think it's and Beth can talk more about this, but using all of these things throughout the curriculum and not just at the end. Mm -hmm. And I really see that project planning template is uh, a great life skill for students who are going to be moving on in their computer science world because that well and the project planning let's let's be real like that actually covers so many areas of life but being able to predict what you want to write down being able to predict what you think is going to happen um, and thinking it through ahead of time with that uh, with, with planning it ahead of time and doing your conversation before you actually get your hands on the kit um, is a really important step that computer programmers do. They do it in different ways with different uh, elements of sharing and, um, you know, just it, it can look a little bit different than that strict template, but that's what they do to be able to predict what's going to happen, to be able to talk about it with their colleagues. Uh, it's it's a very important life skill. So the more we can embed that along the way in these um, guided lessons is is a, a great methodology. Um, so I think we have we went over the did we go over the rubric? We did, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So now it's time to. Get our hands dirty. Let's let's create some programming. But first, let's review the pieces and parts. So, um, oh, we have a question. What age would you begin the advanced lessons? Um, that's a that's a tricky one because I feel like there are students who are in high school who haven't done the primary lessons. There are some kids. It's it's just all over the map with what kids have as their understanding. If students have gone through the primary lessons um, and they can understand the concept of a constant, and after we go through lesson nine, I think you'll have an idea since it is somewhat sequential lessons nine through 14, um, that'll give you an idea. If you think your student can understand lesson nine, go for it. Um, I think there are some kids at, you know, between the ages of eight and 10, maybe, that would probably be able to handle a lot of this, uh, as it gets more abstract, obviously it's a little more difficult for kids to be able to grasp. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also know high schoolers who who don't know the basics of 
a loop. You know, they, they haven't had that experience yet. And so that's why it's nice to come start at the beginning. Um, if you're, um, so yeah, I guess that's not a very concrete answer. I think it depends on each student. They're, this would be like an upper elementary aged starting with lesson nine about maybe I would fourth say or fifth. Fourth, fifth grade is really yeah when these concepts about from like from lesson nine on to me are like fourth fifth grade because a lot of it you know those the, the math concepts and um mm -hmm. also but one thing i really like is is the way the lessons are all set up and the way coach emperor works is you can speed it up and slow it down based on what the needs of the kids are. And at the end of, there's a check for understanding after each lesson. So you can clearly and quickly. So if you're doing even the unplugged and you have the check for understanding, you're like, oh, my kids aren't getting it quite yet with the, the, the unplugged, then you can you know build off of that before you move to the co-jumper kit. So you can kind of stretch it out a little longer and make sure that your kids are really understanding those concepts because yes, some of them get pretty abstract and pretty in depth starting about lesson you know 10 as you know it gets a little bit uh, a little bit more challenging so i would say you know one through nine pretty much all the ages and then probably 10 on upper elementary would probably be my especially opinion. especially the volume of math and how well they understand their algebraic reasoning and you know things like boolean logic and binary that all comes into play in a lot of their math classes and so when they're you know able to grasp those is a good idea when they're probably ready to move forward with some of this doing it beforehand they may just not get it they'll still have fun <laughs> right <laughs> awesome all right so um just for review um let's go over the the major pieces and parts of code jumper and so i'm going to change my um screen and i'm going to make this one big so on the i'm sharing with my document camera i have let me turn off my i'm getting a bad shadow um so uh, let's see i'm trying not to fall over my chair at the same time entertaining yes good no okay um and then i also have the code jumper app open um on the left and then so on the right we can see um, the code jumper in action. So I'm just going to go through what I have here is the start with is the um, the hub. So the hub is where it all begins. It's the action. It is the um, the biggest pod, and it's what connects to the computer with um, Bluetooth. Uh, so before we get um, going any further while well, I'm explaining these things in the chat, can you put a why if you have a code jumper kit um, with you today that you are using? And that'll just be helpful to help. So we have one, two, three, four. Oh my gosh, five. Okay, fantastic. And that just helps me because if we have the less kits, then I do a little bit more abstract. Um, but we're gonna have a lot of hands on because that's five out of the eight. So, all right, this is exciting. So in the um, um, chat now, if you're, um, if you need help connecting your hub via Bluetooth to your um, five out of 21, oh, that's pretty good. Um, if you need help connecting your hub to Bluetooth, uh, can you put an H in the chat, please? H for help, if it's not connected and you're struggling with that. All right, I'm not seeing many H's. Okay, so I'm just going to assume that if you have a kit that it is connected via Bluetooth and you're ready to rock and roll. All right, so the hub is the big one connected via Bluetooth. We have the play button, which is a large circle inscribed with a triangle. We have the stop button, which is a smaller circle inscribed with a square on the top and the speaker. On the front, we have four ports, which are um, represent each one of the threads starting from left to right, numbered one through four. And then, um, so that's the hub. And then we have for our command pods, the first one is the play pod, computer mouse shaped, two dials on top, one short flat, which is our sound dial, one tall and ridge, and that's our duration dial. Each has a port inside of it. We have a plug that 
looks like a mouse cord coming out of one end. And then the opposite end from the cord is a port to plug in other command pods to that. So we have the play pod. We have our loop pod. They're all the same shape, except for the loop pod has a flat yellow dial on top and two cords, one to complete the loop and one to a uh, longer one and one shorter one for the, um, to continue on and connect to other play, um, command pods. And opposite that is the port as well. The two new, pod, uh, new things that I'd actually like to introduce you to today are the selection pod, which is um, same shape, but it has two dials on top, one dial with two spokes, one dial with three spokes. And below each of the spoke of the dials is a port, a corresponding port. Um, and on the opposite side of that is the cord that goes to another command pod. And this one is green and white. And I like to think of the merge and the um, selection pod, we'll talk about the merge right now, as a match set. So the merge pod is uh, computer shaped, except for the top is flat and very smooth. And there's one port coming out of the long, you know, in the one long side. And then the opposite side are two short cords. And then we'll go into detail of how that actually works. So I also have um, all of my plugs. So you notice in the kit, you have all these different plugs and we have a lot of different kinds. So the plugs are purple, an inch and a half, two inches or 12 feet. I have no idea how to judge distance. So it could be six miles for all I know, but it's about an inch and a half, I'd say um, in length with the little same kind of plug that you find on the end of the cords. And each one of them, we have different kinds. So we have eight which have raised numbers on them, similar to a die. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all with raised dots. And then we have, those are our constants. So the next lesson we're gonna learn about are these constants. And then we have four other plugs that have different functions. We have one with an, um, a raised lowercase print R on it. And that is our random plug. So it'll randomly choose a sound one through eight or randomly choose um, a number one through eight. And then we also have the infinity plug, which is the print infinity sign, again, raised. And then we have the counters. We have counting up and we have counting down. Um, and then the other type of plug we have are, are different. They're much bigger than the, um, than the purple, um, plugs and these are called the variable plugs and they are um, longer and um, on the top is another port and Beth is going to be telling us all about those later on. So when you get your plugs in the kit they come in a plastic bag and there's a great little like square that they all live in and my hack is I took a piece of styrofoam cut it to be about it's about 10 inches long you know, two, a little more than two inches wide and about an inch thick. And I just, I just stuck all the plugs into this piece of styrofoam so you can easily find them, you know, so they're not rolling around on the table and they're easy to get to all of them in order and organized. So that's my little hack that I use to take care of all of my plugs. And it took me a long time to kind of figure that out. And as soon as I did, it was, it was much happier because they were always all over the place. Okay, so now let's let's dig into actually building some things because that's that's why we're all here. We want to build. So we're gonna look at um, lesson nine. So lesson nine is all about constants. And so what is a constant? A constant is a fixed value that cannot be changed. And if you reach way back into our algebra brains, thinking about a constant, you know, in in, and not a variable, a constant are numbers. A constant is one, two, three, all these numbers. And we have all the way up through eight of these constants. And when we use those, it says, this is what we're going to be, um, sound we're going to be listening to, or this is how many times we're gonna be looping. It does not change it. It makes it very, just as it says, very fixed, very stable. Um, okay, so we're going to create a program um, from lesson nine and the materials we need are our code jumper kit, our computer science journal, if we were if we were doing that. And if you would like to take notes, feel free. 
Um, and then there are four different code cards, but we're not going to be using all of them. Um, but we also have sound set mapping, which is the very first thing that we're actually going to do. I love this activity. It's really fun. OK, so on the screen, I have um, two tables. And the header rows for each of the table are as follows. It's column one is trial. Column two is the play pod. Column three is the constant. And column four is the sound. So I have trial one and I have trial two. And in, in, on, in column one, it just tells me, use the sound set animals. So that's the sound set we're gonna use. And the point of this is we're going to make a program with three play pods. And then we're going to put in the constant because this is the mystery animals. And we're gonna put in and create a program and not knowing what we're gonna come up with and see exactly how we're going to um, have this program run with different types of animals. So I'm gonna move some things out of the way and then we're gonna create our program. So I'm changing my screen back to, um, there we go. Okay. And on my screen, I'm actually going to have, let's see if it'll cooperate. Of course it won't cooperate because, let's see here. Um, I'd like to actually have on the screen as well, um, my PowerPoint presentation. So we can still look at the code card. You just have to let it, um, uh, let me move it. There we go. Okay, let's see if I can get it to my snap. Okay, there we go. Um, all right, so I have on here, um, on the screen on the right, I have my um, view of the um, document camera showing my, um, showing my hub and, and my program, the PowerPoint presentation with my um, table, and then also the app when I plug things in. So first thing I need to do is set my thread one, to the correct sound set, which is animals. So I'm clicking on thread one. And of course you can use your mouse too. Um, and under sample sounds, I'm gonna find animal sounds. So I just clicked A to get up to animals. All right, now I have the right sound set. But my program says I need three, I need three um, play pods. So in thread one, I'm going to plug in my play pod. So I just inserted it into thread one until it clicked. So I know it's connected. And then I'm going to, um, to the end of that first play pod, I'm going to add in a second one. Okay, second play pod has been added. So now I have two lines of code and um, adding in a third one. So I have three play pods all connected. So I have my program. But what I need to do now is insert my constants because the um, it shows on the app, it says play pig, play horse and play lion, but that's that's not what we're interested in. So with this, um, with, with this lesson, I encourage the kids, don't look at the app, use just the code jumper. So we can kind of, to start with, so figuring out what these constants look like. Um, so it's telling us, so in play pod one, insert constant number four. So I'm gonna pull out constant number four, which is the purple plug and insert it into my um, sound dial. All right, so I, I put that one in there, constant number four and it shows up on the app. And the second one is saying, put in constant number seven. So I put in constant seven. Okay, and it, and it, um, it inserted there. And then for the third one, the table is telling me put in constant number one. So I insert that in pod three into sound dial. Okay. So now, okay, I don't know what these mystery animal sounds are. So I'm going to hit play. Okay. So now I have, I need to listen to that again. Sheep. Dog. Horse. Okay. So that was the mystery animal. So that I know now that in the slot four, the sound number four is a, what was the first one? Sheep. Sheep. Okay, and the second one was? Dog. 
dog. And then the third one was horse, horse. Okay, so now we learned that in slot four, the value of the constant four in this sound set is a sheep. And the value for seven is a dog and so on. And now, okay, let's, let's kind of do so. We got to error check ourselves and let's, let's just verify this is right. So the second trial says, change the order. Put in constant number one in play pot. So I'm going to pull out these, these plugs and I'm going to put one, constant one into one, the first play pod, four into the second play pod, and seven into the third. And now let's press play and see what happens. Sheep, dog. So horse, sheep, dog. Okay, yeah. So we know, we just verified that we know number one is a horse and so on. Um, so it's really great for kids to kind of get that correspondence that, that that fixed value in this play pod means this. And another thing what's really nice about the constants is so I'm going to just go ahead and turn the sound dial on the first pod. And so we know that sound is the horse. <laughs> three times and it's always horse because it's that constant, it's that fixed value. It's always going to um, play the horse. So if you accidentally bump your, your um, sound dial, it's not gonna change it. So that's a good way to keep it stable and on the same sound set. So that's just the first kind of introduction to how the constants work. Um, there's a lot of fun things to do with you know, making it a mystery and building it into things. And um, so it's really kind of fun. All right, so Let's move on and um, maybe in the chat, if you were able to build it, throw in a, um, uh, throw in a comment, how did you do? Were you able to, to figure out your mystery animals? Um, it's pretty fun. Okay, so we found some mystery animals, but now what if we have a, um, we wanna build a program where um, we may not know the order. So I'm gonna go ahead and build another program. Um, I have in here a code card that says, and we're not going to do the loop right now. So we're going to take the loop out of it for just to be conscious of time. It says we're going to use a thread in thread one, make new friends, which is a song. So what if you don't know? Um, what if you don't know how exactly how it goes? So we can figure that out easily. So we're using a thread of make new friends. And the um, code says play, so we use a play pod, constant one for one time speed. Play constant two for one time speed. Play constant three, one time speed. Play constant four, one time speed. And then it tells us the name of each one. And then it looks like Fern says, I built it readily, but for some reason had to restart the code jumper app to get it to play. Interesting. Sometimes I think, that, that's kind of standard issue for all technology. When in doubt, restart. <laughs> that's standard for the year 2020. <laughs> right, exactly. I don't think I could agree more with that. Okay, so I'm going to quickly build this um, program. So for those of you who are following along and building, so we need to make a program with four play pods in a row. So let's connect four play pods in thread one. So pin one, I connected one pod, then I connected a second pod to the end of the first one. So that's one, two, and then I need two more, three. And we can hear every time I, I insert another pod, you can hear that click. Okay, here we go. So now I have, now I have a program with four um, play pods. And um, now we need to make sure we're building the right sound set. So I am still on animals. So I have to change my, go back to my app, click on the, um, the thread one and change it to make new friends. So I'm just going to press M to take me down to the M part of the alphabet because all the sounds are alphabetical. And then I have now have make new friends. But I don't think it's not in the right order and the speed's not correct. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this so we can hear if it's correct. So I'm just gonna press play to start with. 
Make new friends, but keep the old. Make new friends, but keep the old. A circle is round; it has no end. Make new friends, but keep the old. Okay, clearly that that I don't think that is correct. So we are going to actually use our um, we're going to use our constants to go through the right order. And I've actually in, you know, in real life, was trying to figure out how to use the sound set for, um, for Beethoven's fifth. And I was really struggling because it's pretty complicated and I couldn't figure it out. And my super smart engineer friend said, use constants, put them in, you can figure out the proper order. And that's how I figured out how to create the code, the program and the code for, um, for uh, Beethoven's fifth, which is, that's especially true, Robin. Don't you think that's especially true for students who do not hear different in um, tone, like the different tones of the sounds? When you speed it up, it changes. And sometimes students who don't have that, um, especially vocabulary around whether or not the sound is higher or lower, if they're not quite there yet, using the constants is an easier way than just trial and error by listening, especially if it's a when there's words, it's different because there's the words help identify what part it is or what sound it is. But right. when it's just a tone, like a like a piano key stroke or something, um, it can be more difficult. And that is where constants can also come in handy. Absolutely. No, that's a great point because it, it can get confusing. And if you're not, uh, I've had a lot of students over the year who have perfect pitch, but not all of them. <laughs> Very fun. OK, so it's telling us play constant one. So I'm going to take my constant one and I had put all of my plugs right back into my little my little tray to hold them so I know where to find them. So I'm taking plug one, putting it into the um, into the sound dial of plug one. Okay, so now it changed in the app. Now it says constant, make new friends, but keep the old. So that's the beginning of my song. But also we have to make sure that code card said for one time speed. So on the play pod, using the top, I mean, using the taller dial, I'm going to turn it so it's one time speed. Make new friends, but keep the... Okay, there we go. So one time speed. Now the second one, it says constant two. So I'm again taking constant two, putting it into my, um, into my play pod, second play pod. Oops, but Oh, I think we might have to do some debugging, but we'll see. And into the third play pod, I'm putting in constant three. And then into the fourth play pod. Okay, I know I've made a mistake. And so going back to debugging, but let's listen to it and see if I'm correct. Make new friends, but keep the old. That's how long I want to be your friend. A circle is round, it has no end. One is silver and the other's gold. Okay, you know what I think I did? So we have to do a little debugging. So we have to reach back in our brains about debugging, which is finding an error, is I wasn't properly chase tracing my code as I was putting these in and I put them in the wrong spot. So now I need to debug this and put the plugs in the right spot. So I start back from one and the second one needs to be two and I have a four in there. So I'm gonna put that in there. Then I have to trace to number three and put my plug in number three and then put the fourth in the fourth. Okay, now, good. Now let's, we're gonna play this one more time and see if this makes more sense. Make new friends, but keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. A circle is round, it has no end. That's how long I want to be your friend. Awesome. So that makes sense. That's fantastic. So using my constants, I was able to make this program. Um, What's really great about this one too, is you can put it into the thread two and using the dials, you can put a pause in. And this is a great song as a round, so using multiple threads. Um, but that is that is how you can use the um, constants to really create a really nice um, program 
Um, one, stability of not accidentally bumping your sound to a different one and knowing exactly what sound set um, sound is in that slot one through eight. And that's going to show us uh, more depth and um, a little bit of what actually um, all those sound slots look like. And then the constants will make even more sense. So um, if I'm going to pause for a moment, see if anybody has any questions. If you'd like us to speed up or slow down, just please let us know. And if you don't have a kid, it can be kind of abstract to not have it in front of you. So please let us know if this is, if something is just not quite jiving. All right, so going back to our um, PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. So that, that is the constant. So now we're gonna look at what Beth and I, I think we both decided that the um, selection pod is one of our favorite pieces of the entire code jumper kit, which is really great. So we're gonna look at the um, selection pod. So if you have a kit, um, think about um, pulling those out, making sure you have access to, to those. So in lesson 10, selection and random. So we're also gonna use a plug. Um, in addition to the selection pod, we'll use the random plug. But what is, um, what are selections, you know, what does this look like? So the vocabulary, let's start with that. So if we have an if else statement, so we want to check and see if some expression is true. And if it is, do something. And if it's not true, otherwise do something else. Um, defining a statement that evaluates true or false. For example, if it is raining outside, I will wear my boots. Else I will wear my sandals. So if you look outside, you check outside and stick your hand out there and you're like, oh, it's raining. I need to wear my boots. Go get your boots and put them on. Or you go outside, it's not raining and you're like, oh, I can wear my sandals. So that's that if else concept. If something's happening, you do this. If it's not, you do something different. Um, so that's, that's something we actually do every day in our lives all day long without even really thinking about it. And this is taking those really abstract concepts and we can make them completely um, concrete and which is, is really fun. So I'm, uh, um, I'm gonna create a program. And like I said, this is really fun because I like to think about this in terms of O&M, it's a travel and you get to come to a fork in the road. So if you think like choose your own adventure where you're, you have different options and pathways. So let's get into it. But first, before we do that, so we have the if else statement, but then we have a conditional statement. So that is a rule that will run when certain conditions are met, such as a true false statement, right? The rule that we said is if it's raining, I have to wear my boots, which if you're my eight-year-old, you say, if it's raining, I wear no shoes. <laughs> 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 I'm going out and jumping in the puddles is what he says. <laughs> I'm sure Beth, you can relate to that. <laughs> oh yes. I was actually thinking if it's raining, instead of walking the dog, I ride my bike through all of the puddles and try and get as dirty and wet as I can. Absolutely. Okay. So thinking about this, so we have um, a, a lesson in the materials we need. We need our co jumper kit computer science journal. And then we have two code cards in this lesson. Frere Jaca is one and then Helen's story. And today we're going to do Helen's story because we're getting closer to Halloween. So this is kind of a spooky story. So we thought that would be kind of fun. All right. I have a code card. So we'll read the code card and then we can give you a minute to pull out all of the pieces and parts that you need. So we have thread one for Helen's story. So we can choose that. Play. Helen is looking for her friends for one time speed. Play, so that's telling us which pod to use. So basically what command we're telling it. So play, she thinks they might be in the, for one time speed. Play, haunted house for one time speed. Play, she opens the door for one time speed. Ah, and this is where it gets tricky. And then you have an if. And we're giving it a value of random. And this is where a random value plug comes in. And we'll talk about that when we actually do that. If random is greater than four, then play her friends jump out and yell surprise for one time speed. Else 
play, she sees a ghost and screams for one time speed, end if, end thread. So the first part of that's that, that code card we have all, you know, from looking for her friends down to opens the door. That's the setup. So thinking about this as a story, you know, you have to work it, you have to set the stage, especially for something spooky. So you're setting the stage as the beginning of the story. And then we have these two different options. If random is greater than four. So remember we have eight sound slots. So an eight options. So that if that random value is greater than four, so it's five, six, seven, or eight, then you play the first one, her friends. But if it's not one, two, or three, if it's lower than four, then it plays the ghost. So let's just build this, let's get into it. So we need uh, six play pods and we need the selection pods. Um, selection pod and the random plug. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll all just start pulling this stuff out all together. So I'm gonna switch my cameras and um, Let's see that, that. Okay, so now up on the screen, I have again, the document camera, the PowerPoint with the code card and the code jumper app. So I have so far on the table, I have the selection pod and I have my random plug. Um, and then I'm gonna pull six play pods. I'm just gonna line them up on the edge of my table so I can easily access these three, four, five, six. Awesome. Putting my plugs back into my little holder. Okay, so let's build our, oh, let's build our program. So the selection pod doesn't come for a little bit. So I'm gonna set that on the side. So in thread one, I'm gonna put in my first play pod and it just clicked, um, but I need to change my sound set. So I'm going to click on make new friends on thread one and change that to Helen's story. Okay. So now I have Helen's story. I'm going to turn my sound dial until we get to, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, I have the wrong, I have make new friends. I need to look at my code card. Go down. Okay, Helen is looking for her friends. So I'm gonna turn it until we hear Helen is looking for my friends. Helen is looking for her friends. There we go, okay. And so we're just creating a continuous program, adding in a second. Okay, a second play pod. And the code card says play. She thinks they might be in the... She opens the door. Her friends jump, she sees a ghost. Helen is looking, she thinks they might be in the. She thinks they might be in the, okay. And then the third line of our code says haunted house. Going for haunted, ooh, and I think we're right there. Haunted house. Haunted house. Haunted house, okay, so we're, we're doing the setup. We're all getting a little frightened now. We have a haunted house, so the buildup is the suspense, it's too much. <clears throat> Okay, adding in the fourth, and she opens the door. Okay, I'm gonna turn this. She opens the door. She opens the door. Okay, the speed was a little off. So I have my first four, just your typical um, program, four play pods. And now we need to really look at the, um, look at the, the selection pod. So the selection pod again, has the um, two dials on the top, and then there's, co there's a chord and the one <laughs> chord sticking out and the opposite side are two ports. So let's put the selection pod into the last play pod. Okay, we heard the click. Okay, so on the app, it says, it has all of our four play pods. And then it says if, and then what it says right now is if eight is greater than five, and then else and if. So on the, on the selection pod, we need to add in a play pod, one to each port. So um, if, if this is not making sense, please throw a note in the chat and we can help walk through that. Okay, so now this is that kind of thinking about that fork in the road. 
So I have a selection pod. And then just like when you get to a fork in the road, you can go left or right. And so on the, on the actual code, it says if eight is greater than five, um, play her friends jump out and yell surprise, else play, she opens the door. So first thing we need to do is read our code card and put it into the correct sound set. Um, so first one is correctly, her friends is correct. Um, is that, yes. So and that one is constants with your students. If you wanted to, to speed this process up, you could give them constants for some of this, if that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if you're Absolutely. trying to focus on the Haunted house. of selection. Cupboard. She thinks that Helen is look. She sees a ghost and screams. All right. Okay. So um, now we have it all set up properly, except for one piece, this random plug. So we have these two dials. Seven, eight. And in the two spoke dials, because our code card says if random greater than four. So we put the random plug into the um, two spoke dial. And then the three spoke dial says greater than four. So we turn the three spoke dial until it says four. 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 There we are. So we have created our entire program now. And what this random plug will do is determine our ending. Because if random is greater than four, so that random, remember that the value is five, six, seven, or eight, it'll play her friends jump out meal surprise. If it is less than four, one, two, or three, then it will play she sees a ghost and screams. So let's play and see what we get. And I'm gonna make sure I trace the code. So I'm touching each pod as it goes. Helen is looking for her friends. She thinks they might be in the haunted house. She opens the door. Her friends jump out and yell, surprise. Okay, so it says her friends jump out and yell surprise, which means that that random number value that it picked was greater than four. So let's do it again. Helen is looking for her friends. She thinks they might be in the haunted house. She opens the door. Her friends jump out and yell, surprise. Okay, let's try it one more time. Helen is looking for her friends. She thinks they might be in the haunted house. She opens the door. Her friends jump out and yell, surprise. Okay, so that's three times in a row. And was, you know, the next one most likely would be, but I'm not going to torture you guys and make it. Let's do it yet again. Maybe we'll do it one more time. <laughs> um, but one really fun thing to do with this is you can think about probability because like we have three in a row. So if you, if you give your students um, a pair of dice, and you have students roll one die that represents the two spoke dial. And then you, then you um, roll one die that represents the three spoke dial. Then you can kind of map it the probability that you're going to get one or the other. And then it's another fun dynamic or dimension to be able to um, use dice to figure out which one is which if you don't want to use the random plug or use it in addition to, which could be really fun. Um, so you can just kind of go through and then there's that selection of which way you can go. And there's another option in here, it says haunted house, but you can, there's also cupboard. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of different stories you can create in this, um, in this program to you know, add in different endings um, and stories, or if you create your own sound sets, that could be really fun building a whole new, um, whole new program. So let's try just one more time to see if we can get the other one, just, just for good measure. Helen is looking for her friends. She thinks they might be in the haunted house. She opens the door. She sees a ghost and screams. Yeah, so we got both of them. So we had three of one, one of the other one. Totally random. So that's the random plug. And you can also put the random plug in the, um, in the sound sets too. And it'll just pick one a random sound between one and eight as well. So... That's kind of fun. Um, oh, Vern got ghost twice in a row. Yes. <laughs> Your haunted house is super scary. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. I love that. I know I do too. So fun. Okay. So now Miss Beth is going to take us through a whole nother concept um, using plugs. So we're going to um, switch drivers and then Beth's going to share and um, we're going to be talking about variables. So I'm going to stop sharing. All right. There you go. All 
Alrighty. Can you can you see my screen? I can. Yes, perfect. All right. So variables are kind of the opposite of a constant, not technically, but variables in coding are basically different names. And the one that comes to mind most often in uh, my world of little boys and loving pirates is X marks the spot. A lot of times in algebra, we give a variable a name or a letter like X. And students love that because X can represent all kinds of different things. It could be the treasure and the treasure could be gold. The treasure could be ice cream. The treasure could be um, something out of the prize box. Um, and in this case, it's, it's not that different. A variable is a placeholder and it holds a piece of information. And as students grow beyond code jumper and into the next level of coding, they'll get to create what that variable actually is. Sometimes it's hundreds of lines of code that they name and call it something. And then later they want to call it again, but they don't want to have to write all hundred pieces of code or all hundred lines. So they give it a name like X. And in Code Jumper, that's what um, that's what you'll see in just a minute. So the, the variables are represented um, with the large gray plugs that Robin was uh, showing earlier. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to demonstrate now. I'm going to pull out um, <clears throat> the variable plugs. You should have three of them in your kit. So I have three here. And I'm going to create <clears throat> a, um, oops, let me switch to the next um, slide here. I have a little table up here and, and sometimes this is helpful for students to see if they need a really tangible way to understand how things are changing. It's confusing sometimes when, when a name or something on the screen is the same, but it has a different name to it. <clears throat> so we're gonna show you kind of how you could do that with this chart. Um, so I'm gonna pull out three play pods and a variable <clears throat> plug. The first play pod I'm gonna plug into one of my threads. And I should probably make sure code jumpers turned on. <clears throat> wait for the click. Oh, it's not connected. Come on, little buddy. There we go. That's what you're waiting for. Give <laughs> it a minute. Okay, so I have I have my three play pods in a row. Um, I there, I'm going to just randomly set this up for some different different sounds. Okay. If I wanted to make a code and I put right now with nothing, no variables in this at all, the app says play sound. And in this case, because I've got the people sound set, it says play ghost for one time speed. So in this, in my PowerPoint here down at the bottom, this is just a chart to try to help kids if they need more concrete ways of understanding this, they can make a chart and it kind of helps to see how things change. So right now it says for play pod one, it says ghost. Play pod two says sneeze. Oops. And play pod three says surprise. So these are the three sounds in, oops, <laughs> the three sounds in the original program. If I put the variable plug, so this gray plug that has um, a notch in the, or a hole in the top of it. If I put that in the play pod for play pod one, where there was originally the ghost sound, the app changes and now the app looks like play X for one time speed in the first play pod. The second play pod still says sneeze and the third play pod still says surprise. The only thing that changed in the code was that it says play X for one time speed instead of the name of, that, of a sound. Um, in the chart, if I plug 
a constant. It's, the, the cool thing about the variables is that you can plug them into the play pod, but you can also plug something in on top of the variable plug. So we can put a constant into the top of the variable plug. This is essentially naming my variable, saying, <clears throat> okay, variable, I want you to have this sound. And so by picking number five, I'm choosing the fifth sound in the sound set. And if I plug in the, and I just happen to choose five, you could choose any of the constants. If I plug the, the five purple um, uh, constant plug into the variable plug, which is inside the play dial, the app changes again. This time it says, x equals five. So the first line of code says x equals five, which defines our variable. And in coding, that always happens. You always have to define your variable before you can call the variable again later. And then the second line of code says play x for one time speed. But the other two play pods haven't changed. We haven't added anything to them. We haven't done anything with them. They haven't changed. Now, if I wanted to, I could, oh, actually, let me just hit play real quick so that you can hear what it is. So it was a laugh, a sneeze, and surprise. So essentially, this is the X marks the spot. The X was, uh, because I put the constant five in there, it's pulling the laugh sound. Well, let's say I just really like the laugh sound. I could put the variable plug without the constant five in it into the play pod of the other dials. And it is going to pull whatever was inside of that variable. So we defined the variable as constant five. And so every time that variable is called, it's going to pull whatever that fifth sound is. So let's listen to it again. The, the, the the app has changed and now it says X equals five. So the variable is always the first thing to find. Play X for one time speed, play X for one time speed, play X. So it's, it changed the sound name from surprise to X. So I overrode whatever it was before. If I turn the sound dial, it wouldn't do anything. It's when I hit play, it's only going to take whatever was in as the variable definition from the beginning. This is a very simplistic way of trying to explain what a variable is in coding. And if you're not familiar with computer science, that's okay. If you start to understand how this works just within CodeJumper, this is a huge, wonderful bridge to understanding how this works in programming. You can get really lost in programming if you didn't understand what a variable was. So if this is new to you, don't worry, you know, hang, hang with me for a minute. So I'm going to hit play and this is where I would probably ask my students to predict what they think is going to happen when I hit play and we have three X's, one on each line of code for each play pod. So let's see what happens. There were three laughs. There were two different speeds of the laugh. So you can change that if you wanted to. Um, but each sound was pulled again. So even though we don't have a, a constant five, we could pull the same sound again and again and again. And this, when it gets more complicated, it, um, it becomes more necessary to be able to use variables in your coding. CodeJumper doesn't have enough um, like it doesn't go into great depth with hundreds and hundreds of lines of code yet. And so we don't have to do those um, at great depth. So it might seem redundant at this point, but it's, a, it's such an important skill and concept for kids to be able to understand. Um, and as they're, you know, as it gets longer and they start making more and more programs, if they start making their own custom sounds and whatnot, um, that can be a useful tool to, to pull a variable from before so they didn't have to to recreate the whole thing again. So right now I am going to um, stop sharing that and just go over here and talk about um, custom sounds. So custom sounds is a really cool thing that allows a lot of creativity within CodeJumper and autonomy. Um, 
students are limited in what um, they can do in terms of being able to visualize things in other programs. You know, um, being able to make the robot jump or something, students may or may not be able to see that. But with this, uh, students can create and have a lot of ownership over what they want the program to be able to do because they can hear the sounds. They can actually create the sounds. So CodeJumper isn't a program where you would record your own sounds. You would need to use your device or some other device to be able to record the sound. You can either record your own or you can borrow some free sounds off the internet if that's something you uh, know how to do. Uh, CodeJumper allows for .wav files or MP3 files. Um, and you can pick up to eight of them per sound set. So let me show you real quick how that works. Um, in this case, you would already have had to record your sounds or have your sounds downloaded to your computer to be able to um, do the steps that I'm going to do. So you may not be able to follow along right now unless you already have some sounds you know you want to make, but you can just watch what I'm doing or, or listen in to what I'm doing so that you can follow this. It's pretty, it's actually pretty simple. In the CodeJumper app up at the top uh, toolbar is a button called sounds. And when I choose that button, it gives me a screen that says manage custom sounds. I have already created one sound set. Um, so it, it actually lists all of the sound sets on my computer right here, but we're going to be adding a new one. So we're going to right next to where it says custom sound sets, I'm going to add a sound set. I need to give my sound set a name. And so another box opens and says, you know, enter your sound set name. And then again, this is the set of eight, it will be, it could be up to eight sounds. So I'm going to call this sports sounds. And I'm going to select done. And then underneath that is the option for sounds in this sound set with a drop down menu. And there are, if I select the drop down menu, I get to choose which sound in the list I want to add to. So I'm just going to happen to pick sound number one. It tells me right now that no sound is added. So I'm going to select that one and choose. I have three options, listen, add, or delete. So for sound one, I'm going to choose add. I'm going to add, hmm, I, I, I did some special things for Paul here. I'm going to add. He liked the sports sounds. He does. Basketball. I'm going to call oh, mine ping, ping pong. All right. And I'm going to. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Did someone I have a question? Like ping pong, I like it. <laughs> oh, that was you, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm going to select add sound file. I, and then it will ask me where on your computer is this file. So I'll have to upload it directly from, from there. And then I will select done. And when it is finished, that initial drop down menu with all eight sounds, if I go back to it, you could see that sound one now says ping pong, because that's what I named it. Sound two says no sound is added because I haven't added sound two yet. Uh, if I go to sound one and, and select that one, I can actually listen to it right here. Can you guys hear it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I can delete it if you wanted to or rearrange it. So that's it. I mean, that's, it, it, it walks you through pretty easily. The hardest thing is getting your sounds and deciding what sounds students want to create, what poems, what, how they want to divide up the sounds. If they want to have something like a story, choose your own adventure, where they want to pause in that. Um, and that's about it. Select the home button to go back and then your sounds are right there on your CodeJumper app. Um, Let's Where do we see. find the custom sound sets? And like, how do you pick your custom sound set? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, right here, I'm in the app. And my thread number two is where I was doing that demonstration. If I select next to where it says the thread or the sound set name is there. Right now, I'm on percussion, the category, sorry. <clears throat> I would select the drop down arrow where it says sound category and go down. My choices are sample sounds, which is kind of what most of Robin and I have sort of demonstrated today, MIDI instruments or custom sounds. And I just made a custom sound set. So mine is in custom sounds. 
And then when I select that, I have another drop down because I can have multiple sound sets. I had a sound set called trains, but I just made my sports sound set. So I'm going to choose that one and select OK. And then right now it just automatically dumped my three. Um, the lines of code say play ping pong for 1.5 times speed because I have three play pods attached. So it, it repeated that line three times uh, automatically. I mean, who doesn't want to hear some ping pong in the background? <laughs> All right. ding, ding. Um, we did have a question um, about the um, file formats, which are you know, WAV files and MP3s. Um, the one, the question, the other part of the question that I do not know the answer to is the size limit of the files, which we I have not yet tested the limits of how big you can put a sound in there. So. Um, I don't know, um, Leslie, if you know that, or we, that's probably something we need to find out from the, um, from our programmers and well, our I don't guys. know, but we will find out and yeah. let people know. That's a great question. Absolutely. So, all right. Um, Beth, are you frozen? I think Beth might be frozen. I think she is. That's oh, okay. I can actually, um, if I can, can I um, steal the sharing from her? Yes, you can. Continue? Yes. Okay. It's like 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 playing a card game. Let's see here. Stop participant sharing. Nope. All right. Oh, I'm just gonna share. Okay. I'm gonna. Yes. You should be able to take right over. I did. Good. There you go. All right. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Okay, so a few things before we, we, we finish up, um, you know, thinking about um, how do what comes next after Coach Jumper? So we've talked a lot about in between all of this time, where does Coach Jumper lead us? Well, Coach Jumper is that really great base found, uh, foundational, uh, you know, learning about computer science, the basics of it. What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Concepts. And then where do we take it? into our next, um, the, the next level. Well, I'll show you two different programs that, that we actually see, um, you know, many, many um, teachers, you know, start out with these programs after block coding, um, with whatever it looks like. Um, one is Quorum, which is an accessible language um, that a lot of students use um, to learn the next um, text-based coding. So we go from, block-based visual drag and drop to this really idea of, of text-based of text coding where you're actually putting in the code, the parentheses, the colons, and all these different things. And then there's a, there's the whole bunch of different tracks. You know, this is Quorum. So there's the uh, basic lessons for core. There's um, visual programming. So they have a visual version of it, audio programming. Um, there's robotics track, works with Legos robotics. Um, and then uh, I know there's information for teachers here, principal track, um, and uh, well, I just lost my train of thought. So there's all these different options in, in Quorum for finding the right text-based coding for your students. And then the other one, a lot of students is, and I have had so many students, I had one just last year who was um, using Python in eighth grade. And so, which is text-based coding and at the top of the screen. So I'm just showing the website where to find it. So um, I'll put it into the chat of where you can find, um, let's see here, chat. There we go, there's the chat. Um, and um, we have, uh, let's see, Quorum. So I'll put Python in there first because that's where I am right now, python.org. So that's a good starting spot to learn. And then Quorums is um, quorum, quorumlanguage.com is the website for Quorum. And so that's a, um, uh, those are two great starting spots, but let's talk about what can we do this year? So which jumps into our next um, little bit of information, which is, what is Computer Science Week? So Computer Science Week is a week from, this year is December 3rd through the 13th. And it's in honor of Grace Hopper, who was an amazing woman, who was the, um, learned the 
Um, she, she was a computer scientist. She was in the Navy. She came up with the term debugging. She, she was an early pioneer of computer science. And so that's really an honor of her birthday. And so then they, there's an organization called Hour of Code and code.org. So if we look at Hour of Code, there are, um, and, oh, oh, I'm gonna go to, it's not uh, cooperating. Um, Hour of Code. Hour, not horoscopes, Hour of Code. Here we go. Okay, Hour of Code. It's um, a great opportunity for um, students to learn about coding and many schools do it. And apparently over 1 billion students have, have done Hour of Code. Um, and so it's an opportunity to learn more about coding. There's a lot of great resources um, on the website about coding in addition to Code Jumper. Um, and there's activities and all sorts of things. And look, um, keep your ears out, keep your eyes out. Um, we will be having some more materials for Code Jumper for Hour of Code. So as soon as those all come, we have more information. We'll let everybody know of what's available. So you can build your own Hour of Code, use all these materials that we have um, for your students using Code Jumper, uh, which is really exciting. Um, this this year to get those kids involved. And so it's any time between December 7th and 13th and a lot of your students will be hearing about that in their classes. And so then it's a great opportunity for them to participate. Um, resources, again, where do we go now? Uh, Codejumper.com, which we showed you with all of those great information on the resources and the lessons and also education.microsoft.com. And uh, I'll just stick, oops. And we can stick that in the um, education.microsoft. Mike, I go soft. Dot. That's one of those words for me that I have a hard time spelling. There we go. Education.microsoft.com, as well as the Code Jumper website, to learn more. Um, and there's some other websites that we have found that are just have a, are a great resource code.org k12.cs.org, csteachers.org, and cs for all So these are fantastic resources that you can use to learn more about the basics of coding and, you know, so build up your knowledge base and find things for your kids to do um, in addition to Code Jumper as well. So um, with that, we'd love to answer any questions that you all have um, and whatever we can do to help you out, let us know. Sorry about the brief um, intermittent. I lost my connection for a little bit. Oh, no worries. Again, it's 2020. <sighs> All these things. I said. Okay. So I just put in the, in the chat. Oh, there we go. You guys are so far ahead of me over there. Um, all of that great information for those websites to go check out um, more about coding and the basics. So thank you so much for coming today. I appreciate um, all your input. Thanks everyone. Not seeing any questions come in the chat. I'll give them a minute, but before I do, I wanna say thank you to Beth and Robin. This has been fabulous. We, we get to hear all sorts of sounds with you guys. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on your toes, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's kind of neat. And I guess I'm going to have to go researching different sound sets that we could include. We'll, we'll add a couple more haunted house stories. How's that? Yes. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> that would be good, definitely. <laughs>